verse 30. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on, on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Please be seated. It's good to have you all with us today. Let me encourage you to grab a Bible, turn that to Judges, chapter um, 3, verse number 9. Uh, if you don't like that, grab a Bible and turn to Obadiah, chapter 1, uh, the last verse. Either way, we're going to start in both of those verses here momentarily. When we think of the word Savior, we think of it as a capitalized, um, very specific noun to one person, don't we? You and I think of Jesus the Christ, the one who was from that city of, of uh, uh, Nazareth, and that's the one we think of when we think of saviors in the Bible, when in fact, saviors have been found all throughout the Bible. In uh, the book of Judges, chapter 1, or chapter 3, in verse number 9, God said he would send a deliverer in Obadiah chapter 1, since there's only one chapter, in the last verse, he said he's going to send saviors out of Zion. There are going to be people who save the nation of Israel and, and do those things on a localized level throughout the entirety of the Old Testament. When you and I describe and look at the word savior, here's what we, here's what we think in our mind. One who saves another from danger or destruction or one who provides protection from an impending or imminent danger or doom. And I think of, realistically, I think of superheroes. How about you? You think of somebody being in impending danger, the next box should have someone flying in to rescue them. And that's not a bad idea of the way you and I think of Savior, just that word, through the Bible, God would use men and women to save others from impending danger. The word that we're looking at, Savior, has had a, a, an odd etymology. Etymology means how the word changes through the years. Notice this. If, uh, when I was growing up, my mother would ask me if something was lit then what she would want to know is, is something lighted properly so you can either see it or walk by it so you don't hurt yourself. That is not the case today. That is not the case. And for you who might be a little bit older than me, you at one point in time probably used in your vernacular the word salty. Guess what? It's back. And it means the same thing. So you can use that word once again. Words change, and over time they change either good or bad, or sometimes they change back. And so as we look at the etymology of this word, let's start with how it was used by God originally. Different saviors are found in the Bible. Noah was a savior. You know that ark that he built was a gigantic structure? And, and as he is gathering animals, or rather as animals are being sent to him by God, you know, when, when he puts those animals on the ark, he doesn't need a, a basset hound and a, and a blood hound and a, a great Pyrenees and a, a chihuahua. He doesn't need all of those different varieties of dog. He needs a dog, and he gets a two-for-one if that dog has fleas. But as big as this structure is, and as long as Noah preached, each floor of this structure would have been 53, roughly 53 tractor trailers side by side. Why do you have all that extra room? Why was Noah preaching to men to get on this boat? It was to save them. 
It was to save them. God would have saved anyone who got on that boat. That boat was not exclusively for eight people. He would have saved anyone that got on that boat. And as Noah preached for 120 years, no one would listen to the cries of this man who was trying to save humanity. In Joshua, the book of Joshua, what you and I find in verse number one is that the servant Moses, the one who was the servant of God, has died. Who's going to take these people across that river, that flooding river? Who, who's going to, to uh, usher in these people into the promised land? Who's going to be their savior to, to deliver them to the land that God would have provided for them? Luckily, in the book of, of uh, is that one that starts with a D? Deuteronomy. <laughs> Luckily, in the book of Deuteronomy, what you and I see is God grooming Joshua in order to take the place of Moses when he dies. We see him first as a captain in the army. We eventually see him as a general and one that, that, that uh, Moses would look at and ask questions of. We see him being groomed to be the savior, the deliverer of the people of Israel. Look at Gideon. You can find him in, in uh, Judges chapters 2 and 3. When we first find Gideon, He is inside of a wine press, and he's threshing out wheat. And you and I know that process where, where you grab the, that wheat, and you throw it in the air, and the chaff, the, that paper-like chaff, separates away from that heavier grain. The grain falls, and the chaff sort of blows away. You know they did that on top of a hill? Regularly, they did that on top of a hill so that the chaff would, would blow away, and they wouldn't have to deal with it. And here's what I told the uh, 7 o'clock crew who came here this morning, and I'll tell you too because it was fascinating to me, and I don't care if you like it. But, by the way, when that chaff would, would uh, find its way into corners of, of houses and, and up beside bushes and things like that, it would be extremely dry, and that's where they would start their fires. They would use that for kindling. But as he is inside of this uh, wine press and he's, he's throwing up this grain and it's separating, did you ever ask yourself why he's in that wine press? The Midianites are trying to starve them to death. They're trying to starve them into extinction. For Gideon to have this grain would have been illegal. Would have been contraband. But Gideon's mindset is my family and I have to eat something. And so he is in here in private trying to to uh, separate this grain from this chaff so that they can have something to eat. When God's angel comes to him and says, I need you to lead an army against the Midianites. And he said, well, I guess we can get one together. As that, this army is produced, you find 3,000 people ready to go. And God says, you've got too many. First they had 10,000, they whittled it down to 3,000. Then he still said, you have too many. And so they whittled it down even further down by the river, down to 300. Now I'm going to tell you something. An army of 300 ain't a lot. And yet Gideon leads this army and he saves the nation of Israel as one of the deliverers. In Judges chapter 6, the last verse, you find only one verse in the entire Bible about a man by the name of Shamgar. And we see him as a warrior. We see him as one who, who killed thousands of the enemy with, a, with an ox goad. For you who have never really traveled by ox cart, here's what it is. It's the um, accelerator for an ox cart. It's uh, eight, ten feet long. One end is shaped like a small paddle uh, for digging off uh, clumps of dirt onto your plow. On the front side of that is a spear point, a sharpened point on the end of this eight, ten foot uh, piece, of, piece of limb. And when that ox would stop, he would stab it in the foot and then it would start moving again. And he took that dull, interesting implement and he defended the nation of Israel with it all by himself, huh? 
Oh, no. It was because he was sent by God. We see Elijah and the 450 prophets of Baal. Contests are fun, aren't they? Did you enjoy any kind of contest yesterday? Saturday in the southeastern portion of the United States? Perhaps some college football? Perhaps for you who are really big football fans, you'll enjoy some sort of contest this afternoon. Elijah decided with these 450 prophets of Baal to have a contest. He said, you, you put on your altar whatever you'd like to offer to Baal. I'll put on my altar what God would require me to offer. We'll have a contest. Whoever's uh, God will light the fire the first. He'll be the God that Israel serves. You see the 450 prophets of Baal put their, their sacrifice on the altar. You see them pulling the hairs out of their beard and, and throwing themselves onto their altar and crying out to Baal and, and cutting themselves and, and trying everything that they could to have Baal light that fire. And then you have Elijah who says, all right, let's build an altar. And around this altar, dig a ditch. And then I want you to pour water into this ditch so that the water fills up the ditch. Now, a lot of times we look at, and, and at that ditch and we sort of calculate how much water would fit in there. And we say, X amount of gallons would have been a lot of water. Let me add a wrinkle to you here. Elijah is doing this, uh, is, is creating this process and pouring water over this altar in a dry, arid place. Before it fills up, how much ground, how much water does the ground suck up? You want to see the saturation of an altar? Here it is. How many of you have ever built a fire? Just me and Michael. All right, well, good, Michael, good. Every time I've built a fire, that fire burns up. Anybody ever have one burned down? God does right here. When he sends that fire down, it first consumes the animal, then the altar, then the water. Mine burns up. God's burns down. What an interesting idea. And yet Elijah here saved the nation of Israel with as much courage as he has. We'll find him in the next chapter alone by the brook of Kedron being fed by ravens because he's scared to death. We look at saviors in the Old Testament, we see David, and we'll only look at one point of David's life, but it will be a reflection of all of it, and it's after he comes back from killing Goliath, as he's toting that big sword on his shoulder through town. There are some ladies there, and they begin to sing. Saul has killed his thousands, and if, if the song just stopped, Saul would be happy with that. If I had a song about me where, where it just gave you my exploits of, of warriorship and how great of a, of, a, of a warrior I am, then I'd be happy with that. But instead of seeing the positive side of that, Saul looked at it in a negative fashion when the next phrase was, and David has killed his ten thousands. Oh, no. While he's carrying that gigantic sword after he has saved Israel from the threat of a giant. We see saviors all throughout the Old Testament. We could go on and on and on and on about saviors in the Old Testament. But every one of these saviors that are found in the Old Testament saved God's people from a physical destruction. That's their purpose. They were there to save them from some sort of physical problem that they were going through. And then we turn over in John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, in verse number 14, and we see the Savior capitalized as the one that we think of. 
the one who our mind automatically goes to, the one to which we are ascribing the word Savior. And in John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, we see a time period before creation where the word dwelt with God and according to verses 1 and 2, was God. The one in verse 5 who was the light of men, the light shined in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. The one who in verse 14 was said to uh, understand the word this way, and the word became flesh and, and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory as of the only begotten full of grace and truth. Now, I'd like for you to look for a moment at the word became flesh. As, as we look at that word in our minds today, we, we look at a process that might look much like uh, some sort of cellular metamorphosis. You know what that is? Butterflies, you know, they... From, you know, from a caterpillar to a butterfly, you have a different cellular metamorphosis. But this is not Jesus the Christ. This is one who was God, who came and, and, and put on a coat. The, the word literally means to pitch a tent. He, he, were, he was putting out some sort of temporary housing. He wore a coat of flesh. Uh, he looked like us. He had fingernails like us. Everything like us. Ten toes, ten fingers. Ears, eyes, nose, mouth, all that kind of thing. Teeth, baby teeth that would fall out and new ones would come in. He had all that. And he was God. We get very much caught up in the fact that Jesus was here and what he, or perhaps what he looked like and, and, and how he would have spoken and to whom he would have spoken. And sometimes we let slip the fact that he is God in the flesh. Jesus the Christ, the Savior of the world, was sent to this earth and he saved man physically while he was here. But see him in, in John chapter 9 as he spits on the ground. A seemingly disgusting action, uh, but he mixes some sort of clay, miry mud mixture, and he places it on the eyes of a man who is blind. Tells him to go wash in the pool of Siloam. He goes over there, washes his eyes, and immediately he can see. Let me tell you something. I can spit on the ground here in Arkansas. I can make a mud-type mixture, and I can rub it on your eyes if that's what you want. It's not going to help you see. Jesus is the Savior who saved man physically. Remember those ten lepers? He said, you go, you show yourself to the high priest. That's the way they were going to be seen by the society as being cleansed. And as they went on their way, they were cleansed. And there was only one who came back. Did, you remember Jesus' famous question, where are the nine? Uh, they're being verified as being clean. Why? Because of what he did. You remember that man in, Ma in Mark chapter 2 who had those four friends who, who led him down right at the feet of Jesus? Couldn't walk. And Jesus said to him, Take up your bed and walk out, and he did. Not only did he just walk out, he got his bed underneath his arms and walked out. Jesus healed the physically ill while he was on this earth. How many would follow him for a meal? How many would bring those sick to him? How about the lady who touched the hem of his garment when he asked with the crowd pressing in, Who touched me? And his disciples would say, what are you talking about? A whole, a whole pile of people touched you. And he said, no, 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 someone, someone touched me. He would heal people physically, and that's a good thing. He was the Savior of many people physically. And notice this. While he doesn't heal us still physically today, he's still saving man spiritually. He would save man spiritually while he was here. Woman, where are thine accusers? 
Neither do I accuse thee. Go and sin no more. Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. He would heal those spiritually while he was here, and he still does that today. But he doesn't do it through any other way other than through God's word. Now listen to what he says as he heals man and saves man spiritually today. Matthew chapter 13 and verse number 9. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. You know, it's impossible for me to do what God says to do unless he tells me what he wants me to do. If, if God wants me to try to figure out his ways, I will fall terribly short. Jesus would say in, Matt, in John chapter 8 and verse number 24, unless you believe that I am, you'll die in your sins. Notice verse, verse 24 of John 8. In your copy, you probably have a phrase that says this, unless you believe that I am he. Now that he that's written there would be italicized, which means it would have been added so that you and I could round out that conversation. Unless you believe that I am he, you'll die in your sins. It detracts from what he's saying. So you take that he out, you have Jesus referring back to himself as deity. In um, the book of Exodus, as Moses is asking God, who am I supposed to say sent me to get these folks here out of, out of Egypt? And he said, the I am that I am. You tell them that I am sent you. So when Jesus says, unless you believe that I am He's making his claim toward deity. Unless you believe that I am God, you've got no other hope. And I think that's where the entirety of God's plan hangs on a thread. See, it depends on you and me if God will save us. Are you going to believe that Jesus is or not? Because if you are, then whatever he asks, you're going to do. But if you don't believe, you can't take the next step. After you and I believed properly, Jesus said we had to repent of our sin. Luke 13, 3 and 5, I tell you nay, except you repent. See how personal that is? Except you repent, you'll die in your sins. Matthew chapter 10, verse number 32 and 33, Jesus saving man today would say this, unless you Confess me before men, I will not confess you before the Father. Would you like to stand there on that day of, of judgment? And say, Jesus, say something for me. And you just stand there silent. Why, why won't you say something for me, Jesus? You never confessed me before men. Why in the world would I confess you before the Father? Hear the voice of Jesus in, in Mark chapter 16, verse number 16, as he would say, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Is baptism important? Yes. It's just as important as hearing, believing, repenting, confessing. Jesus would also say, one of the last portions of him speaking through inspiration in the Bible. In Revelation chapter 2, verse number 10, the latter portion of that verse, he would say, Be thou faithful unto death. You be faithful unto death, and I'll give you a crown of life. Did Jesus save people while he was here? Yes. Was he, was he the Savior of men's body while he was here? Yes. But the saving of men's body pales in comparison to the saving of men's souls. Jesus would finally say in Matthew chapter 15, and don't be afraid of the man who can kill your body. You be afraid of the one who can kill your body and your soul in hell. As a matter of fact, man is saved in the same fashion as Adam and Eve were saved. 
You know what God expected from Adam and Eve that he expects from you and me today? Faithful obedience. That's all he expects. So when he says, would you hear what I have to say? When he says, would you believe it? When he says, would you confess, my son, would you repent of your sin? Would you be baptized in water for the remission of your sins? Would you be faithfully obedient to him? And when you've put on Christ in baptism, and you're walking that walk, does your life reflect Christ? You might say it, it did. Did is not going to be good enough. Does. Does it reflect? If it did, it still can. You can still come home to the Savior, to the, to the Father. You can still come home to the one who saves Man physically, but man spiritually, most importantly. You can come home to him today. Or you can put him on in baptism today. We're going to sing a song here in just a moment for your encouragement. And as we do, I want you to think of Romans chapter 6 and verse number 23, where the Romans writer would write this, for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus, His Son, our Savior. Are you subject to heaven's invitation? Why not come home right now while we stand and sing for your encouragement?